Welcome to the latest episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. This is January 20th, and we're on our third episode of the new decade. I guess this is the uh, the 20s. We're almost through January, and we've covered uh, some really good books and authors this far. Uh, be sure to check out all of our past episodes, as well as our flagship site, paperbackwarrior.com. Of course, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and always feel free to email us at paperbackwarrior at yahoo.com. Tom, what uh, what books and authors do we have scheduled today? My notes uh, have crisscrossed. Okay, no problem. So we're going to be doing a feature on the Jerry Ahern, uh, kind of an overview of his career and the many series that he's associated with this. Uh, yeah, dovetailing into that, you're going to be doing a review of Survivalist number one. I'm going to be doing a review of the brand new Quarry book by Max Allen Collins, which is called Killing Quarry. And this is the part of the show where you ask me about a road trip I just took. Hey, Tom, have you taken any road trips lately? Well, thanks for asking, Eric. I, uh, I certainly have. I took a trip down to uh, Fort Lauderdale, and um, actually a trip from uh, Boca Raton to Fort Lauderdale to Riverview, uh, three towns in Florida, and visited three different bookstores and got, got a couple books I want to tell you about up, up right off the top. Uh, in a place called Bookwise in Boca Raton, this is a fairly wealthy suburb. I got a. Um, I found it wasn't a great bookstore, but it was pretty good. I, I bought five purchases. I bought got the good stuff and more good stuff by John D. McDonald. You ever heard of these? I haven't. Okay, so before John D. McDonald was writing standalone novels, which is also which is all, before he was writing the Travis McGee books, he wrote probably a thousand short stories for the pulps under different names, mostly his own. But and what he did is he compiled um, a bunch of these into two compilations: uh, more, the good stuff and more good old good stuff. More good old stuff uh, from the 1940s and early 50s. They're pretty sizable paperbacks, but I like John D. McDonald, and I haven't really explored his short stories too much. I also got a... um, You ever seen these series? This Bart... Bart Gold. The Bart Gould spy series. I got a Baron Sinister and the President's Agent. Here's what's weird about this, and it took me a a while to realize this. One is written under the house name of Joseph Milton... One is written under the house name of Joseph Hilton. I have both of those books, and I've struggled with where to put them in my collection. It's frustrating, isn't it? And, <laughs> and, and so I, I tried to figure out what the heck went on, and I went, go to where I always go, uh, and went to Spy Guys and Gals to have him unwind it. So the Bart Gould series was an eight-book series, with the president's agent being the first one, and Joseph Hilton was the actual author of this. He also wrote—is um, that right? That may, or, that may not be right. Okay, so Joseph Hilton is the real author. Joseph Milton is a house name. For books number two through eight, it became house name books uh, with with someone named Hal Jason Kalin, C-A-L-I-N, and sometimes pairing with his wife, Anne, writing a bunch of them. Um, And those are supposed to be the good ones. Hal Jason Kalin wrote books two, three, and six. Books seven and eight, no one seems to know who wrote them. And the review, uh, there was actually a comment on Spy Guys and Gals saying that Kalen's uh, the best of them all, and the other ones are just sort of like nondescript Nick Carter books. So I don't know much about the series. I love the covers, and at some point I might try one, but I'm not optimistic that they're going to be great. I think Gerard Butler should play Bart Gould in the, uh, in the uh, theatrical adaptation of you these You think he books. looks like the guy on the cover? No, but uh, the president is missing. Isn't that like the Olympus has fallen? Oh, yeah, 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 that, yeah, whole, that, that whole series. Whole, yeah. Of, yeah, he's, are, are those based on books? No. Okay. No, those are original. Um, the last thing I got at Bookwise in Boca that I want to talk about talk about really briefly is this Ellery Queen book called The Black Heart's Murder from 1970. Ellery Queen's this crazy uh, author situation where there's no actual person named Ellery Queen. It's been a series of house names. Ellery Queen was a detective. But then there's a bunch of uh, series novels by the house name of Ellery Queen written by other people where, in which Ellery Queen is not the main character. And this is one of those. The main character of this one is someone named Mike McCall. He is a special assistant to the governor in an unknown state. Um, there's three books in the series. The first book is Campus Murders by Gil Brewer, writing as Ellery Queen. Second one is the blue – I'm sorry. The second one is this one, The Black Hearts Murder, which is written by my guy, Richard Deming. And I'm going to do a whole episode on him. The third one in this series – 
the Mike McCall series, is the Blue Movie Murders by Edward D. Hotch. He's a, mostly a known as a short story writer. In fact, I think he wrote as a short story in every episode, every issue of Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, stretching from the 50s through today. Hmm. Um, anyway, it, this one looks sort of interesting. It deals with racial tensions in the 1970s and a black militant who wants to kill right-wing uh, um, white politicians. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be any good, but Richard Deming's good, so who knows. Yeah, yeah. So that was pretty much my trip to Boca. I'll be quicker on the other ones. Um, I went to a place called Big Apple in Fort Lauderdale, and they had a box of blades. By that, I mean an entire box of the Richard Blade series and the Blade series by um, the End World guy, David Robbins. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, it was odd. Like, I wonder if the if someone didn't understand that those are two different series because they both say Blade in big letters. I didn't buy any of those because I have all I need. I did get three of the Saint books, the movie tie-in ones with Roger Moore on the cover. I got an Alfred Hitchcock book called Happiness is a Warm Corpse. And I got a John Gardner um, action novel called The Stone Killer. And I know you like him. And it was made into a movie with Charles Bronson. And so I have the movie tie-in version. Then I went to a bookstore in a small town called Riverview, Florida. A very weird little town and a very weird little bookstore run by some old ladies. All the books were like wrapped in saran wrap or something. It was really weird. Hmm. But there was nothing vintage whatsoever, with the exception of a very robust Western section where I got three books. One's called Arizona Outlaw by Bain Hobart. One is called Hangman's Mesa by Dan Stevens, who's a pseudonym for someone. I can't remember who. And the most interesting one here, which I think you may care about, is The Hellbent Kid by Charles O. Locke. You ever seen this one, The Hellbent Kid? I think I, I think I have that. It's on a lot of people's list of the best 100 westerns ever. Like if you go to lists of people who know a lot about it, open up to the title page though. Actually, the very first page, uh, not even the title page. And see what happens. To my friend Marty, signed uh, Charles uh, Locke, uh, the or the author. The author. This is a used book. Signed hmm. by the author from probably the 1950s. Yeah, when is this? Uh, when was this published? Know, probably 1955, 60. Yeah, 1957. 1957. So the bottom line, Eric, is I'm rich. <laughs> you might be. <laughs> and, and the bad news is you're fired. This is my podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was my uh, that was my big road trip. Uh, anyway, three bookstores. I don't know that um, Big Apple's really worth going to in Fort Lauderdale ex- unless you're really looking. F- I really kind of cleaned out its vintage stock. But ask the lady behind the counter where the vintage stuff is, and she'll take you to, like, the secret box of blades. Mm. Um, Bookwise and Boca might be worth going to. It looks like that's a nice bookstore that has a lot of turnover in its inventory. Um, and But don't even bother with the bookworm in Riverview. So that was my that was my road trip. <laughs> All right, so if we want to move on to the feature now, and I'm going to need your help with a lot of this because I am not a huge fan of Jerry Ahern, although I respect him as somebody who's an important figure in this. He's probably one of the most con- – um, let me throw this out. You can tell me if this sounds right to you. Jerry Ahern is the most commercially successful author in the meds, men's adventure genre, second only to Don Pendleton. Would you agree or not agree? I wouldn't think that that would be the case. Who else? Who's who's bigger than Jerry Ahern? Who's bigger than Jerry Ahern when we're not talking about Mac Bolan, the Mac Bolan universe? Right. Well, let's say Don. Let's say Don Pendleton and the Mac Bolan books is, are, is the most successful series in men's adventure, and like he's the biggest brand name, right? Don Pendleton. Yes. But who's number two? I would say Joseph Rosenberger uh, with the Death Merchant series. It went eighty ish or eighty books, and they're sitting on books. That's interesting. You think you think that they were more popular than the Jerry Ahern series? Yeah, but Ahern didn't really have any long running uh, series other than Survivals, right? Um, Defend- no, I think that's fair. But okay. this, I, I just find this. I guess I see more survi- more Ahern books floating around, and so I think they probably had higher print runs. Okay, so you think Rosenberger is the second most popular? Um, well, you know. simply because he was the uh, lone author of all seventy nine Death Merchant books. No, I, I think that – I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm saying yeah. it's interesting. I would not – I mean, I think there there would be an argument that, um, you know, maybe Warren Murphy, right? The Destroyer right. was very successful. And uh, even though he farmed out a lot of that, I mean, so did Pendleton. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So anybody, let's say Ahern's up there, though, right? In the uh, in in the, the people who are super successful. I think David Robbins is very successful because he's had so many big series. Uh, how long did uh, Penetrator run with uh, Cunningham and? Uh, oh, that was a lot. What was, was the other guy's name? Four, yeah, uh, I don't know the guy in North Carolina or whatever. Uh, the forties, maybe all, maybe maybe even the seventies. Uh, the you just got all the Penetrators, so you have better feel for it than I do. But yeah. um, all right. Well, anyway, so Ahern had I think you could say five major series. Uh, the Survivalist being the most popular. The Defender, Track, They Call Me Mercenary, a series under the name of Axel Kilgore, and then a three-book series called The Takers uh, that I think the th- first two were from the mid-'80s, beginning in 1984. There was a, a one at the end in 2001, uh, co-written with his wife Sharon. And I suspect that Sharon was really co-writing stuff all along. She's a, very, she's a pretty successful author in her own right. And I know she's active on Facebook, and uh, and she's doing a very good job managing the Jerry Ahern estate and the intellectual property that they own. And so, and she has claimed, and I have no reason not to not believe her because she's a good writer, um, that that she was collaborating with Jerry all along. He wrote two Nick Carter Killmaster books: The Turkish Bloodbath and Sleigh Ride from 1980 and 1982. He wrote two books in a series called Rodeo under the house name of Red Mitchell. He had a three-book series that I don't know much about called Surgical Strike between 1988 and 1990. He also wrote a handful of standalone books and some nonfiction books on how to carry concealed weapons and survive disasters. This guy was the real deal. He was really very involved in kind of the gun movement, the prepper movement, and I think at some point he actually was selling retail products of, of holsters and stuff. His name was Jerome Morell Ahern. He lived from 1946 to 2012. He died at age 66. He was born and raised in Chicago. He was a very well-known columnist for Guns Magazine and Gun Digest. He was a big Second Amendment advocate and an early thought reader in the uh, Doomsday Prepper movement. A thought leader, rather. Uh, He also had a popular column in Soldier of Fortune magazine doing new product reviews called Terrain and Situation. Anyway, like I said, his wife Sharon is still alive and well. And they were collaborated. So what I want to do is just sort of walk through his significant series, and you pipe up when you want to weigh in okay. uh, with, with the understanding that we're doing a more detailed review of The Survivalist Number 1. So The Survivalist ran from 36 installments between 1981 and 2019. Uh, it's been kept alive by Sharon, and we'll discuss that later. The series continued beyond Jerry's death with Sharon Project Managing Books and written by a guy named Bob Anderson, uh, probably with her heavy editorial hand. There was a gap between 1993 and 2013. Uh, there were 27 original installments and then nine in kind of this new reboot. The, the series stars Tomic, Thomas Rourke, an ex-CIA agent, and kind of a, a doomsday prepper himself, but probably before they had those words. A nuclear war happens with the Soviet Union that devastates the United States, and because he's the little pig who built his house out of bricks, he survives and launches a one-man war against the lawless hordes of gangs roaming what's left in North America, as well as the Soviets who move in to occupy our fallen country. As you might expect, there's a lot of technical specifications about gun and survival gear in the uh, series. Here's what's weird. Midway through the Survivalist series, Rourke, his family, and two sidekicks break into NORAD, which is now controlled by the Soviets, and take the cryonics equipment and freeze themselves before a second catastrophe strikes that will kill almost all life on Earth. So the group of people who put them, who froze themselves wake up 500 years later into a deeply post-apocalyptic world filled with cannibals and sci-fi adventures, battling unfrozen Soviets, unfrozen Nazis, unfrozen Chinese, sometimes with the help of Icelandic volcanic volcano dressers, uh, dwellers. So halfway through the series, um, the it becomes a science fiction series. He basically time travels 500 years into the future. Uh, the series is extremely popular in France. Um, it was popular here in the U.S., but it was very popular in France. And they licensed the series to an author named Frédéric Chapier, who wrote an additional 20 installments that have not been translated into English. So that's The Survivalist. His, uh, he had a series called The Defender, which ran 12 installments from 1988 to 1990. The setup for that one is that the Soviets are teaming up with urban street gangs to take over America through terror attacks. A handful of patriots launch a guerrilla war against this highly corrupt cabal to fight back. There's a lot of right-wing wish fulfillment in this one and liberal anti-gun straw men uh, who are quick to appease the Soviet gangs um, end up uh, getting their, their comeuppance. 
In our Hall of Shame episode, we discussed Track, which ran for 10 installments from 1984 and 1985. Uh, you read the first one and said it was pretty bad, uh, and uh, I tend to probably agree with you. I didn't bother reading it. It's about a former CID cop uh, named Dan Track who's trying to track down 99 stolen nukes from a madman. This premise of the 99 nukes was abandoned a few books into the series, and he became kind of a generic action hero. Not supposed to be great. Then there was the They Call Me Mercenary series, uh, written under the name Axel Kilgore, which ran for from, for 17 installments from 1980 to 1984. Uh, Zebra Books came up with the idea of a hard-boiled killer mercenary with psychological problems and a missing body part. This was during the height of uh, Soldier of Fortune magazine's popularity, and Jerry's name was synonymous with Soldier of Fortune because of his column. Mercenaries were a hot property in uh, 1980. Uh, Jerry had a friend named Axel, and he and Sharon were driving through Kilgore, Texas, so the pseudonym of Axel Kilgore was born. They were juggling the survivalist and They Call Me Mercenary at the same time. The main character in They Call Me Mercenary is Hank Frost, and instead of a missing limb, as Zebra Books requested, they gave him a missing eye, so he can't see 3D movies. <laughs> he also had a bad back and a good sense of humor. Uh, they, are, they remain available through speaking volume books in print, ebooks, and audio. And I've actually heard good things about the series, but I haven't read any. I've got a bunch of those, and they're on my list to read, of course. Yeah. But... Uh, like I said, there was a three-book series called The Takers, by, uh, which was released by Gold Eagle uh, starting in 1984. It's uh, on the cover. It said it was compelling action in the spirit of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it was also kind of mixed with X Files type stuff. There were Nazis, archaeologists, a search for Atlantis, aliens, UFOs. Pretty thick books, as I recall. Uh, lots of digs against liberals in it. Uh, there were inter- interdimensional porters. The main character in the Takers, I guess, was very, very similar to Thomas Rourke, and that one was clearly co-written with Sharon, and she may actually get credit on either the copyright page or some of the editions of the covers. Um, What I'll say about Jerry Ahern, having uh, read just a few books by him before we kind of get into survivalist number one, is that he was a good writer. Um, He wrote excellent action sequences, lots, a little too many details about gun specifications and product placement type stuff, which just isn't my interest, so it it wasn't for me. Um, A lot of straw men, like left-wing straw men being like held up, like, like everybody who's left of center is is presented as an idiot and ends up getting their comeuppance, uh, which I don't really care about anyone's politics, but the polit- but having politics kind of shoehorned into books like that, like the uh, John Stone books, just isn't my thing. And uh, my biggest problem with him, with the Defender series and the Survivalist books that I've read a few of, is the serial nature of them. I mean, he really was writing one giant novel with the, each book being a chapter in that story. And so I just don't want that. I, I, you know, I quit reading comic books ages ago for that very reason. That when Survivalist Number One ends, it's like mid mid action, and you have to. They, he's trying to lure you into buying Survivalist Two so you can read it. And it was the same thing with the Defender series. Um, anyway, so that's what I had prepared for Jerry Ahern. Do you have any kind of global thoughts about him or, or anything before we get into? It? I'd love you for you to launch right into your review of Survivalist One because I have some thoughts on that as well. Uh, so go, go, go ahead. What are your thoughts? I'll shut up for a second. Yeah, circling back to what you just uh, what you just said, um, I think it was in Survival Weekly that Ahern described the Survivalist as one long soap opera. Um, it was it was essentially just one long novel that he came up with. Um, I don't know. He could be when we look at the the big genre, which is really hot over the last. I don't know, last five or six years, which is prepper fiction. Have you ever heard that term before? I have heard that term, and and, uh, and I got. I didn't get into the prepper fiction, but I got into zombie fiction when everybody was writing zombie right. books. And so I read a ton of those, which were also very serialized. Well, I think prepper fiction, and I might be pigeonholing this a little bit, but prepper fiction seems to be concentrated around uh, sort of the conservative right-wing Republican views uh, to the extreme. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and I think William Johnstone, when he wrote uh, the Out of the Ashes series, it was very right-winged as well. Uh, and just like what you said, liberals were idiots and so forth. And you know, like you said, I don't care about politics either, but... It's sort of it's kind of irritating after you get through like three or four books of these things, and it's just the same same. It gets same a little it gets a little preachy. It's a gun porn and preachy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but um, and then according to, uh, with track, I, sh- I guess I should say with track, I did get a little bit of uh, feedback from listeners regarding the track series, and as you had mentioned earlier, when they abandoned the chasing the stolen nuke idea, supposedly the series really uh, got much better at that point. Maybe I should revisit the series in later uh, episodes uh, or later installments of the series and try it again. 
but I really despise the debut. Well, it's good to hear that you can be influenced by our listeners' hate mail. <laughs> yeah, I take something positive out of it. So, uh, but anyway, um, let's talk uh, about Survivalist number one because we both have read that, and uh, and I have some thoughts, but I want to hear your thoughts first. Yeah, great. Uh, so, Survivalist number one, Total War, published by Zebra in 1981. In that same Survival Weekly interview, uh, Jerry Ahern is talking about the series and its creation, and he always uses we. Uh, so I think Jerry and Sharon Ahern did all the research and probably co-wrote it to a degree. Uh, the series, like you mentioned, ran from 1981 to 1993 with 27 total books, and then Sharon collaborated with mystery thriller, thriller author Bob Anderson to write and publish an additional seven novels between 2013 and 2019. Uh, the entire series is available. It's uh, affordable, digital, uh, with, I would say, inferior uh, cover art. But Total War introduces readers to John Rourke, uh, his wife Sarah, and their two children. Rourke was a former medical student. He dropped out of college, joined the military, and as a career soldier, Rourke later joined the CIA's counterterrorism division. So he's, he's, he's really a badass. Now Rourke spends his time training survival and fighting techniques globally. In the book's opening act, John departs the family's Georgia home on a business trip to Canada, and it's during this time that World War III takes place, the, uh, the bombs drop. The book's first half is really painful. It's a slow burn. There's a dozen characters, and they're all playing uh, you know, a big game of chess. It involves the U.S. president He's positioning pawns to defend Pakistan from the Soviet Union. Very much. A lot of oh. geopolitical detail. Oh, Painful geez. amounts of geopolitical detail. And he detail. introduces characters that are, are maybe like in two or three pages, and you're like, do I memorize these characters? Do they matter? And they ultimately don't. So I was thankful when the second half of the book began. Uh, the second half is, is set up with the U.S. and Soviet subs coming to blows, and the chain reaction has 60% of America dead. The U.S. president, he delays launching nuclear missiles. He's really hoping that this whole thing will, will iron itself out, but it doesn't. So his delay in launching nuclear missiles leaves only 40% of the Soviet Union's population decimated, along with a lot of their industrial complexes. But the Soviets obviously have an advantage here, so they begin slowly uh, in other books uh, infiltrating the U.S. and, and starting to, uh, to sort of uh, impose their will on the U.S., the second half of Total War is really the traditional post-apocalyptic formula. It's really interesting. John's aboard a passenger jet, and the pilots become blinded after seeing the mushroom cloud. So John forces the plane down in Albuquerque, New Mexico, while across the country, Sarah and the kids are dealing with these, these looters and marauders who quickly attack their residents. Now, in my understanding of these situations, panic and martial law doesn't really come into effect until about 72 hours after we run out of the last box of rice checks, right? But with these books, especially in this particular book, the marauders happen like <laughs> like they, immediately. They, they appear, yeah. It's I mean, my milk has one. my milk hasn't even gone bad yet, and these people are out. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so funny. I didn't, I didn't think about that, but you're totally right. Like, it's it, ridiculous. Like, like, you know, the... Uh, People talk about when the S hits the fan. The S hit the fan immediately. <laughs> yes. and I, that, Before the refrigerators were cool. <laughs> I had a lot of issues with that part of it. After a number of skirmishes and fighting, uh, John and this inexperienced average Joe face an army of savage bikers because every one of these post-apocalyptic series or novels in, in, include savage bikers. And uh, the biker gangs are, are the stiff opposition that, that Rourke and this guy must face. Tom, I really actually enjoyed this book. Uh, it really is just senseless fun. It's not necessarily, I guess, over the top, but it's certainly not believable. Somehow it's still, uh, even in its craziness, it's still more realistic than, say, Last Ranger or Road Blaster or our Hall of Fame stalwart in Phoenix. Uh, but the debut story sets up an arc where John is traveling across the ruins of the U.S. to find his family. And uh, I don't know. I'd certainly entertain reading more of these. And I, actually, I just recently bought the first 18 uh, of the paperbacks. Um, I got them cheap, so I just bought them all. So I think I might read those. But it's funny that this guy whoops, this guy is, uh, is traveling across the U.S. to find his family, which we're seeing 
we've seen so much with the zombie, uh, the zombie books. Like well, right, every single post-apocalyptic book that I've read, and I've read as many as you have, but the you know with the zombies, like you know, somebody is away from their house. And I guess it kind of makes sense that if 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 everything hit the fan and the zombie apocalypse began, or nukes fell, and my and I'm a hundred miles from my family, my first order of business is going to be getting home. But it's such a trope in these novels that, like yeah. you know, the first book or two. Or is them traveling through the wasteland to get home to you know see their wife? Unless you're Phoenix, which the first thing you think about when your family gets killed by mushroom clouds is to go pork every female in L.A. Yeah, no, I, I, right. <laughs> I, I would. I guess I'd see if if Tinder could be downloaded I guess. As, as the mushroom cloud is settled. <laughs> right. <laughs> so here's my experience with the survivalist one. It was summer. 2016, I decided to read Survivalist number one, and my son at the time was, uh, I think, let's say he's 12 years, he was 12 years old at the time, and he wasn't a big reader, liked a lot of graphic novels, but, but you know, would would read anything I told him to. I, I said, hey, wouldn't it be fun for us to do, because he looked at these, you know, all these books I was getting and these beautiful covers and the violence and the, and the action. It reminded him probably a lot of the comic books he enjoyed. And so I said, hey, wouldn't it be fun? And we had just moved from Hawaii to Florida. So he didn't really know anybody here. And so I said, um, I said hey, let's have a father-son book club. I'll get two copies of this of a book and we'll just read it chapter by chapter together and we can read it uh, at the same time. Not like I'm reading to him, but we're both reading it and we could talk about it along the way. And so I chose Survivalist number one, <laughs> thinking like, all right, well, this is fun. It's going to be violent, lots of, you know, post-apocalyptic. He was into The Walking Dead. And, um, and, so, and, then we, and so then chapter after chapter after chapter of like troop movements in Pakistan and, um, and just painstaking detail of like the geopolitical nonsense that was leading up to World World War three, you know, and, and who were the Soviets, Dad? And I'm trying to explain a little bit of history to him, and and you could see his eyes glazing over, and it became a chore for him, and probably ruined his love of fiction for the next like 20 years. I ended up finishing the book, but I was just so honked off at how boring the first half was, and I was not as captivated by the second half as you were. In fact, I, and then when it ends, sort of mid scene with some battle of bikers happening when he's met some woman and and it just sort of ends and I was like oh great I got to read book number 2 which I did and it's fine it was a it was a it was a decent enough book I got a bad taste in my mouth cuz it bored my son and scared him off of books forever um but but yeah. I, I I did not again Read this book if you're interested in having a comic book like experience where you read a book and then it, it kind of leaves you with some kind of cliffhanger and then you read the next book and the next book and the next book. It was, he's a good writer, a successful guy, did a lot for uh, the men's adventure I- industry. So I got nothing but good things to say about him. It just wasn't for me. My favorite uh, post apocalyptic series that's in this vein, that's more of a comic book style is The Last Ranger, and all 10 books are reviewed on paperbackwarrior.com. Yeah, so check that out at paperbackwarrior.com. Uh, you can also check out, uh, I believe there's a post-apocalyptic uh, tag on the right side of the main page, not the mobile version, but the full website. And you can click on that and see the dozens of reviews of post-apocalyptic books. I think nearly all of them were written by Eric. Yeah, I'm the paperbackwarrior.com department for Doomsday. <laughs> so, right. Extension so, number two. Exactly. While, while I'm eating my family members, you're going to be living high on the hogs <laughs> yes. with all your freeze-dried uh, supplements. Yes. All right, should we move on? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, switch gears right now and review Killing Quarry by Max Allen Collins. Uh, Killing Quarry is the 14th published novel in the uh, his terrific Hitman series, Quarry. The chronological order of the books is really a, is a real mishmash, uh, and the um, but the author's done a great job of making every book stand alone really nicely. Uh, this one's a 2019 release, so it's not a vintage paperback, but the series uh, stretches back into the early eight, late 70s, early 80s, and takes place back in the 70s and 80s. So we we consider it part of the vintage, um, uh, you know as a vintage series, if not a vintage paperback. Uh, this particular book takes place in 1986, fairly late in kind of the quarry chronology. Um, earlier in the series, the Vietnam vet turned paid assassin. He can't, comes into possession of a list of other hitmen on contract with his former boss, the, uh, the broker. And Quarry switches his business model to stalking hitmen and hiring himself out to their intended targets to stop the assassins before the kill's complete. That's the setup in this one. So this is one of the ones where Quarry is doing that. But there's some really unusual developments that take this novel in, a, in an unusual direction. So Killing Quarry begins with our anti-hero driving from his home, which is sort of neat, in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, to Naperville, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago uh, west of the city. 
He's uh, chosen the name of a hitman named Bruce uh, from the broker's list to stalk and to his next thing. So the idea is to surveil the Simmons guy, uh, Bruce Simmons, the, uh, the other hitman, till he goes to his next murder gig and then spoil the fun before Simmons can do the job. But things take a shocking turn when Simmons drives up to Lake Geneva and begins surveilling Quarry's home. Yes, Quarry is, his, is Simmons' intended target. Meanwhile, Quarry is looking to kill Simmons. And um, so we're treated to two people in the murder business basically stalking each other for the kill. Uh, the question Quarry then asks himself, quite logically, who is paying Simmons to kill Quarry? And if Corey's uh, habit of killing hitmen has finally caught up with him. Yo. Is this um is this theme is this a recurring theme in the series? Yeah, no, first time ever. Okay. So the him going to kill hitmen um and uh, before before they can make their hit is a theme and he does okay. that and he and he basically finds out who their target is, but he's never been the target before. Okay. And the book again is called Killing Quarry. Yeah. So so he needs to figure out who's doing this. So on um but the idea is that somehow his habit of killing hitmen is caught up with him. Or maybe there's a different agenda. Who knows? The answers are revealed gradually on this roller coaster of twists and turns that provides fans a, an interesting look under the hood of Corey's world of, of hitmen, brokers, envoys, mobster clients. As the allure, the cover art in this one's awesome, right? It's got like the hottest girl ever in a bikini. Um, and there is a sexy hit girl who works her way into the plot. It's interesting to note that Killing Quarry is actually a sequel to the 1976 entry in the series called The Dealer, which was re-released by Hard Case Crime in 2015 as Quarry's Deal. This is the first Quarry book that's an actual sequel of another Quarry book. Now, Collins does a really nice job of summarizing the events of the prequel. So if you're new to the series and you haven't read the uh, Quarry's Deal or you're forgetful and don't remember a book you read two weeks ago like me, um, then you're, you're never going to be lost. That said, if you're working your way through the entire series, you might as well read Quarry's Deal before you read this one, Killing Quarry. However you choose to tackle it, though, you've got to make time for this Killing Quarry book because it's a total winner. Uh, there's excellent action, uh, great humor, hot sex, and a compelling mystery at the core of the novel. Um, it's tough to pick the best Quarry books. They're all so good, but Killing Quarry is definitely among the top of the series, and I can't recommend it high enough. The book, again, is Killing Quarry, by Max Allen Collins. Tom, is the Corey series the most consistent one that you've read? Yeah, and as much as I've never read a bad one, um, there's only 14 of them, so it's not like he's in uh, you know Mac Bolan territory, but it's a great series. I mean, I would say Richard Stark's Parker um, are all really good, too. Some of those are better than others. I would say the the delta between the worst quarry and the best quarry is pretty thin, though. There's not much of a, a difference. They're all really solid, and... Uh, and, it, and again, he's got a really good first-person voice. Okay, sounds good. Well, I think that's all we have for this episode. Okay. I think. Well, uh, thank you for joining us for the Paperback Warrior podcast. Please take a look at the website, www.paperbackwarrior.com, where we have uh, reviews Tuesday through Friday and a podcast every Monday at 6 a.m. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. Hope you arrived at work safely. Bye-bye.